Okay. Most prospective studies that have collected biological samples have used a, used a nested case control design when wanting to look at particular biomarkers in relation to disease risk. And this is because most biomarkers are expensive to measure, and so it's much more cost effective to measure biomarkers in a subset of <coughs> cases with a disease of interest um, and compare that with um, a subset of, of match controls. Now, for UK Biobank, which is an open access resource, this will mean that we'll get requests from researchers um, perhaps to measure the same biomarker in different nested subsets of the cohort for their disease area of interest at different time points. Um, and this will inevitably mean that data from biomarkers would be incomparable across the cohort because you would have biomarkers being measured um, at different time points, certainly using different reagents and perhaps using different equipment. So it quite quickly became apparent to us that for UK Biobank, we needed a different approach so rather than measuring biomarkers in nested, ad hoc nested case control um, studies within the cohort, it would be much more efficient to um, measure um, a whole range of biomarkers that we feel would be of interest to researchers among the full cohort, thereby making this data available to researchers and they can use that for, not, for their analyses as they wish. Now, um, this... While we still fully appreciate that the using a nested case control approach may still be appropriate for some biomarkers, obviously we can't measure every biomarker on everyone, and um, we um, it may be efficient to use a nested case control approach for biomarkers that, for example, that are disease specific or that are particularly expensive or that are perhaps not that well established. So, in order to facilitate this. In the, in the future, we will put out calls, if you like, to invite um, researchers to submit applications um, for a particular nested case control data set that we've created um, once a, a sufficient number of incident cases have occurred, um, to invite ap um, applications to measure biomarkers on this particular nested subset so we can coordinate the retrieval of samples from the freezer to make it a more efficient process. Um, but this particular approach, what I want to talk about today, is our primary strategy, which is to measure uh, biomarkers, a whole range of biomarkers, across the full cohort. There's quite a few good reasons as to why we'd want, we'd want to do this. <clears throat> and first of all, by measuring a wide range of biomarkers on everyone, and that's all 500,000 participants, it massively increases the usability of the resource. So um, researchers can conduct case cohort analysis rather than relying on a more restricted um, um, case control um, analysis in a subset of the cohort. And this may become important, particularly when you're interested in looking at um, subsets of the disease where you, need large, where you need large numbers. Having biomarkers on everyone also enables researchers to conduct cross-sectional analysis of biomarkers in relation to prevalent disease, for example. Um, and it also means that researchers will be able to identify participants with both at either extreme ends of the distribution of a particular biomarker um, for um, recruitment into further studies, for example. So having biomarkers available on everybody um, opens up further possibilities that are either what, what aren't possible using nested case control approaches or are certainly more limited. Having biomarkers measured on everyone also means that we can ensure there's good quality control of the biomarker values if we conduct the assays in all the participants at the same time. And I'll talk a little more about our quality control um, procedures <clears throat> in a moment. Ironically, um, measuring biomarkers in all 500,000 participants is actually more cost, is more cost effective to conduct these assays at one time rather than doing ad hoc nested case control measures over, over a period of time. This is because we, can, we have economies of scale in terms of the purchasing of consumables and equipments and so on. 
And it also means that we avoid multiple retrieval costs if we only have to get the samples out at one time. And of course, it also means we can effectively manage uh, the use of the depletable samples. So, for example, you only have one freeze thaw, um, and we can um, minimize the, the use of the dead volume and so on. So, it's a much more uh, effic effective way of, of, of managing the use of the samples. And of course, by conducting all of these biomarkers at one time, it means that we can make the data more rapidly available to, to researchers rather than relying on researchers coming to us themselves and requiring ad hoc requests for biomarker analyses. So how do we decide, for the first round anyway, which biomarkers um, we to include? Um, we have um, a, an expert um, enhancements working group led by Paul Elliott, and we also um, received a lot of advice from many different experts from across um, a broad range of, of expertise in relation to health outcomes. And um, we, we decided it was, it was obvious, really, that we needed to include biomarkers that were established risk factors for disease. These are biomarkers that most researchers will be, will be of interest in. So, for example, lipids for vascular disease, sex hormones for cancer. We also felt it was important to include some diagnostic markers, so early, early markers of disease, so for example, HbA1c and glucose for diabetes, rheumatoid factor for rheumatoid arthritis. And we also felt it was important to include biomarkers that would characterize phenotypes that were otherwise um, not possible to assess. So for example, biomarkers to capture renal and liver function. So after much to in and fro in, um, we, these are the, the list of 36 biomarkers that we've decided to include in this, in, in, this, in this initial round of biomarkers, as I said. As Rory alluded to earlier, um, we are considering other biomarkers um, to be done in subsequent um, rounds, but these are the lists that, are, uh, are that we're currently um, starting to measure at the moment. And I've grouped these 36 biomarkers into broad areas of disease interest, although for almost all of them, um, they may be of interest to a wide range of disease outcomes. So you can see, for example, a whole range of lipids in relation to um, cardiovascular disease that we're measuring, including inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, and fibrinogen, and so on. Biomarkers that will be of primarily of interest to cancer, but also other disease areas such as the sex hormones, growth factors, sex hormone binding globulin. Biomarkers of interest to um, researchers interested in bone and joint disease, so vitamin D, rheumatoid factor, alkaline phosphatase, and so on. Um, a broad range of liver enzymes, as you can see, and proteins. Diagnostic markers for diabetes, as I've mentioned, and a whole range of biomarkers that are useful for um, assessing kidney function. So these are the lists. Uh, these are the biomarkers that um, we're, we're currently assaying. And as I said, there's other biomarkers that we're also considering. And if any of you have any bright ideas as to what you think we should be measuring on all participants um, in our next round, please do get in touch with us as we're, um, we're very happy to, to take some, some advice from the experts as to what researchers um, really want. One of our um, key objectives on this is to ensure that we achieve um, really good quality control. It's really important going through this project that all the biomarker valuables, uh, all the biomarker values are comparable across the entire cohort. And the way the samples are stored in the freezers, what Tim showed you in those slides earlier, is they're, they're stored, um, they're sort of clustered in the freezer according to assessment center, time of day of blood collection, and so on. So if you pull out the samples from the freezers and put them one by one onto the, onto the assay batches, um, it will be impossible for us to determine whether any changes in biomarker levels between the different assay batches are due to differences in the assay performance due to inter-batch variation, or whether they're simply due to um, clustering of certain participant characteristics across the different batches. So what um, the laboratory and the IT teams 
um, up at the UK Biobank Coordinating Centre have done, have developed an algorithm that selects the samples from the, from, from the, sam from the freezers um, from different assessment centres in order to achieve a widespread of participant characteristics across each assay batch. Um, and this algorithm, it keeps the relative proportions of the samples from each assessment centre constant, so you don't r run out, um, whilst also maintaining a high retrieval rate of about 1,600 samples per day. So this is to ensure that we, we can really closely monitor the quality control of the biomarker values across the different batches over the lifetime of the project. So that was kind of the, the rationale for doing it and, and how you get the samples out the freezer. The logistics of measuring these biomarkers, as I'm sure any of you who have been involved in measuring biomarkers for epidemiological studies will understand, it, it is enormous. Measuring 36 biomarkers at one time on 500,000 participants plus um, 20,000 blood samples from, from people who attended the repeat assessment centre five years later is, 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 is very challenging. So we have a dedicated laboratory up at the UK Biobank Coordinating Centre near Manchester, and we have under, undergone an extensive preparation phase in order to make sure that we get this right before we start, before we start the analyses. Um, we spent quite a lot of time getting the right equipment installed, getting the appropriate staff recruitment and training, getting the appropriate um, laboratory accredit accreditation to do these assays, and perhaps most importantly, making sure that all the methods that we're using to conduct these assays are, 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 are valid and have, we have tight quality control. So, as I've said, we've, we've, we've really made an enormous amount of effort in to determine that the validity of our assays are the best that we can possibly make them, because uh, we need to make sure that the biomarker values are comparable across the entire cohort. So, we've gone to a lot of trouble to validate the methods. We validated to, uh, the cross-multiple instruments to make sure that, any, that the biomarker levels that are coming from different types of instruments um, are comparable. We validated the sample type, so for example, if it's slightly atypical to what the assay is, is usually using, we've made sure that the assay type that, that we use in UK Biobank is sufficiently valid. And we valid all our internal quality control regimes and assay performance. We have string, stringent internal QC measures to ensure that the biomarker stability is stable over time and to prevent laboratory drift and so on. And of course, we also use external quality assurance schemes for biomarkers <clears throat> where they're applicable. Okay, so just to go through the sample throughput, um, for the 36 biomarkers that are currently in this panel, um, we're using both the plasma, the serum, uh, the, the urine, and packed red blood cells um, for all of these biomarkers. Um, as I've said, it's been done at our coordinating centre near Manchester, and with a sample throughput for the urine biomarkers of about 3,000 samples per day. For the red blood cells, which is the HbA1c measurement, the sample throughput of about 1,200 samples a day, and plasma and serum. Serum has a majority of biomarkers um, of about 1,600 samples per day, so a very high throughput to be achieved whilst maintaining stringent quality control. So for the analysis phase, uh, we have 17 high throughput analyses up in our laboratories. Um, and we have multiple systems to account because there will be, we will need some redundancy in the system. And for most biomarkers, we are operating on a 24 seven basis. Now, um, this is pretty unheard of as far as I, I'm aware of most epidemiological settings. And this is a good example where we have the academic community providing us with, with, with what they want. These are the biomarkers that we think will be important to the scientific community. And then taking an industrial approach as to how to achieve what the researchers want in a, a rapid amount of time, but ensuring that the, the, that the methods are of, of high quality as possible. So just finally, to give you an indication of the timelines of when these data will be available, we are going to undertake a phased approach. 
So this slightly simplifies what is, what is an incredibly complex process. And we will um, analyze just a single sample type on each analyzer at any given time so we can minimize cross-reactivity. So the urinary samples um, that, that are starting now, they will take about six months to conduct these assays on all 500,000 participants. So we would anticipate that those data would be available for public use um, by the end of this year, or certainly by the beginning of next year. For the red blood cell sample, which is the HbA1c measurement, that is also starting now, and that will take longer. That's about 14 months, so the data should be available by September um, of next year. And for the remaining biomarkers, the bulk of the biomarkers, which are done on plasma and serum, we will start those towards the end of this year with a view to them being available in October of 2015. And we um, anticipate that we'll release this, this data in phases as and when we go along. Um, so hopefully the aim is that all data from all 36 biomarkers will be publicly available, certainly by, by autumn time of next year. So any, any questions? And I should say that this is also um, an example where um, uh, the funders extended in terms of the support of the, the study um, beyond the core funders to uh, include the British Heart Foundation and Diabetes UK um, who helped to support the, these assays. And uh, um, we're certainly looking for more funders to, to join in this game. Um, so, so questions um, either to Naomi or on lab questions. I'm sure Tim will have a go. Uh, there's a question there. I was wondering um, how many of these assays would be repeated on individuals and how many individuals that would be? Yeah, sorry, perhaps I didn't make it quite clear. Um, we're conducting these assays on the baseline blood samples plus the 20,000 participants who came along to our repeat assessment centre um, last year. So, we're, so we've got baseline blood samples plus the 20,000 repeat, which was taken approximately five years after baseline. And then um, when people are coming to the current imaging assessment pilot, we're also collecting samples. Yeah. And there will be further repeat assessment um, collections in 20,000 or so every few years. Uh, so those will be stored, and then they can be assayed as well to look at shift over time. So a question at the, the back there. Mark Hyde from King Co King's College London. Um, you've mentioned the blood samples being collected again. Will you be collecting the saliva samples again as well? Yeah, sorry, Thank that's you. the blood, urine, and the saliva samples are all being collected again. A question at the far back. Uh, Ken Muir from Manchester. Thanks, Naomi. The biomarker data is extremely useful, and there are other panels of biomarkers that could be readily suggested. Yeah and it's encouraging that these can be considered. My question is, what level of evidence and certainty and generality are required for the biomarkers to be likely to go forward? And secondly, are there any options for measuring panels of biomarkers in important subsets, for example, all the males? Well, I think we'll, we'll, con we'll consider any good suggestions that people have. So um, ultimately, it's, just for, it's up to UK Biobank and our steering committee to decide which, which biochemical markers we think would be of interest to measure on everyone or indeed on, a, on subsets of participants if we think that's most appropriate. So all I can say really is please give us your suggestions and, uh, and, and we, will consider them, we will consider them together and come up with the priorities for future panels. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think from the point of view of the funders, um, they're keen to see the, the research community pushing the way Biobank goes. So if consortia come together and you make a strong case, um, then they can, you know, we're very happy to work with them uh, to, to co and with the funders to try to coordinate a process of getting as much data uh, available for researchers. Um, it was more painful excluding biomarkers from that list than including them. There was certainly a lot that we all wanted in, but we had a budget that we had to work within. There's a question, Dan. <clears throat> Uh, hi, Ekaterini Blaveri from the National Cancer Research Institute. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, usually prospective studies aimed at uh, the early detection of disease and cancer in particular ideally require the serial collection of pre-diagnostic samples. Uh, I, to my experience, uh, early detection biomarker for cancer research has been stalled due to the lack of such samples. I uh, thought UK Biobank could be an ideal platform to, to do that. Uh, are there any reasons why you haven't done it or are you planning to do that in the future, maybe in collaboration with some funders of cancer research? Well, I think this is a good example where collaborations of researchers could get together and put forward a proposal um, to measure early diagnostic biomarkers for cancer, for example. And I think that, you know, uh, the funders would be interested to see that. So, you know, we're open to suggestions. And I think if collaborators can come together and put forward suggestions, then that's fantastic. There's a question just at the front, and then I think we'll probably move on. Claire Turnbull, Institute of Cancer Research. On a related note, at the meeting two years ago in the Welcome, and there were sort of subcommittees uh, brainstorming, uh, there was a discussion about collecting um, tumour samples from the individuals who went on to develop cancer. Um, and then that would be part of the biobank, um, better phenotyping the outcomes, as it were. Has there been any advance on those suggestions? Yeah, well, we're actually just about to start a feasibility study to assess just whether we can actually do it on a, on a large scale to collect tumor tissues. It's certainly on, on, on our wish list, and it's certainly something we're thinking about, and we'll know more in, in a few months' time um, about this from evidence from this pilot study as to how easy it is to collect pathology reports and pathology specimens mm. from the cancer patients from UK Biobank. So we'll, we'll let you know how that goes. I mean, on a related note to the previous um, question, obviously it would be um, fantastic to in some way be able to collect samples that would be amenable to um, assaying circulating tumour DNA, but I can see that that, for many, many reasons, is currently not uh, feasible due to the requirements, um, the technical requirements, and also the, the number of samples that would be required. But I guess ultimately that would... Uh, that would enhance the resource fantastically for cancer researchers. Well, I, I think this is an important point, and, and it really illustrates what Tim was saying. I mean, Biobank's job is to work out how to do it, and it's really for the academic community, people here and beyond, to say what should be done. Um, so, um, you know, we're looking to you to say what you want, um, and then we'll try to work out with you how to do it. Uh, and that probably leads in very nicely to, to the next talk, um, which has been driven by the, you know, the academic community in the infectious disease area and cancer about what might be uh, the next tranche or, uh, of, of assays that could be done. But uh, yeah, the point of this meeting is for you to decide how you want to make Biobank better for your research. Thanks very much, Naomi. <laughs>